I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat. We drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds of nerds. sauerkraut. Wow. Yay! Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco and every time I come back here I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. Hi everyone, I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inforum. Welcome to today's program, She Proclaims with Jennifer Palmieri. Jennifer was the White House Communications Director for President Barack Obama, the Communications Director for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, and is the author of the new book, She Proclaims, our Declaration of Independence from a Man's World. She's in conversation today with Amy Allison, founder and director of She the People, a national network of elevating the political power of women of color. Commonwealth Club has suspended in-person events for the time being, but we are dedicated to keeping you informed during this pandemic. We're going full speed ahead with the full slate of live online programs. Most of these conversations are currently free to the public, so we do ask that you consider donating to the Commonwealth Club to help us continue our work. Please visit us at commonwealthclub.org slash online to learn more, and you can also text the word donate to 415-329-4231 during this live program. You can find this information and more in the description box below. Now, please join me in welcoming Jennifer Palmieri and Amy Allison to inform Thank you. And hello and welcome to today's virtual program with Inform at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Amy Allison, founder and president of She the People. I'm so pleased to be in conversation today with Jennifer Palmieri. Uh, she served as White House Communications Director from 2013 to 2015 uh, for President Barack Obama. 
and was communications director for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. She joins us today to discuss her new book, She Proclaims Our Declaration of Independence from Man's World. Uh, if you'd like to ask Jennifer a question uh, during our conversation, please ask it in the chat if you're watching on YouTube or in the comments if you're watching on Facebook. I am so excited to chat with you today, Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this, Amy. I was like so excited to talk to you. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot we have. So to much. <laughs> let's, just, let's just really start. This morning on the recount, you had a vi video mm -hmm. that gave some thought and context about the impact for um, Congresswoman uh, AOC, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who was verbally uh, attacked by Congressman Yoho on the, uh, in, in, on the Capitol steps last week. He gave a non-apology in front of his peers, and then AOC responded. And how, what do you make of the importance of women leadership, particularly women of color, leading and responding to racist and sexist attacks in this moment? Yeah, so this is, you know, there's so much, there's three big things that are wrapped up in that moment with AOC. First of all, women who challenge norms either by what they say or how they look and what their rise to power represents um, face those kinds of attacks every day. You know, AOC herself has said that she is sort of a walking threat to the way power is um the way that power is divided up in DC, right? She is a young Hispanic woman who beat an incumbent um, member of Congress, right? That is something that a person like Ted Yoho may find threatening. The, uh, you know, when he went after her, it was because he called disgusting the idea that an increase in crime is related to increase in employment and increase in poverty. That is a very conventional idea. It is her, it, it was, it is she who challenged and and threatened him. We need to understand that happens to women, that happens to women of color every day. But what's so amazing about what she did and why I think she's so effective, we think that she's a breakout star because she's great on Instagram. She's a breakout star because she is a master communicator and a very able politician. You know, she has um, learned a lot in the 18 months that she's been in Congress about how to be effective, about how to advocate for policies, about how to do that in a way that is that can be relatable to people, even when it's a very wonky topic, like for example, campaign finance reform. But what she did was, you know, he lashed out at her. She did not lash back. She took a moment. She had her snarky little tweet, but then she gathered her colleagues, knew there was strength in numbers, knew that not making this moment about her in particular, but about women in general and treating the institution with respect, she gave us a moment on the House floor that I think we history will remember for a long time. What was the line that got you in her in her retort? When she said that when you give when a man does this, it gives permission for a man to say that to your daughter. You know, that's just like, oh yes, that's exactly that's the crime, right? It's not just that he said it to a young Hispanic woman who's from a different party or a colleague. It's the giving permission to do that to any other woman. I just, you know, that just breaks through everything. And it broke my heart. Uh, I know, I'm tear up now just thinking about it. Yeah, when she said, I'm two years younger than your youngest daughter. I mean, my God, use, right? Don't use being a husband or being a dad uh, to, to daughters as an excuse for this kind of behavior. I, that got me. She's actually really young and she's young in politics. And one thing- and in everything that she takes on, that's like, and that's the, the husband, father, business has always bugged me because it's like what you're saying is because I love a woman she deserves respect like all women deserve respect right no matter what you know I was interesting because in your book she proclaims you go way back you go back to uh, you know over 100 years to the beginning of expanding the franchise these pro-democracy forces amongst women arguing for suffrage um but it's always been a political system here in America built to privilege white guys over everybody else. Uh, and so in some ways, when you talk about breaking through and not trying to succeed in a man's world, is AOC the example of changing the rules? Yes. And what do you make, what do you make of that? 
She is, and Ayanna Presley, uh, another you know freshman congresswoman. I think that she is, and what I think is so powerful about those two women is that you know I think as women struggling to succeed in a man's world, and to be more specific, in a white man's world, right? We have adapted ourselves to think that we have to behave like them, we have to sound like them, we have to think like them, we have to work harder than them because maybe we don't actually belong here. We're always constantly feeling this urge to uh, a drive to prove ourselves. Not everything we have learned in a man's world is bad, right? I mean, I want us to let go of the doubt, the sense that we don't belong here, the question of our value. All of our life, we've been sent signals that white men are more powerful, more interesting, and have more value than anybody else, right? And we've all internalized that, and we have to shake that. And for women, that can cause us to have a lot of doubts for ourselves. I want you to leave the doubts behind. But the things that you learn that make you more astute and observant the way I think both Ayanna Presley and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are in terms of understanding if I, if I really want to be heard, I could position my argument this way and it's going to break through more. I think, you know, that's what Ocasio-Cortez does so well. And she makes things relatable. You know, congressional hearings are not supposed to be social media breakout moments, but they are for her because she figures out a way to make that connect to a real person's life. Ayanna Presley's superhero strength, I think, is in representing, literally representing the people who are not normally heard from and have been disenfranchised from the beginning of the country. Women, those two women give me so much hope because I think others can look at Congress and see someone who looks like them and is fighting for them and believes that they're part of the country and that's how we can revitalize it. But what those two women, they don't shun everything that they learned it taught them how to be effective by trying to succeed in a white man's world. Take the best of that, harness it, and move on. It's interesting because you have the experience, many, many years of experience, but but I was particularly interested as a communications director for Hillary Clinton's 26 campaign, 2016 campaign. What have what we have experienced and seen through that campaign all the way to now? being just to just a little over 90 days uh, to this election in 2020, what were the assumptions that went behind how to communicate, how to, how to be a candidate at the national level as a white woman? What lessons uh, have, have you learned? what you write about? And, and, and what does this moment mean uh, for women trying to break out of the box of trying to live through uh, a man's world into something else? Yeah, and I guess I should say first, I have never, I used to buck when my colleagues, even, you know, in the Obama White House, as supportive an environment as that was for women, you know, we would, they would say like, oh, we're struggling in a man's world. And I would never want to say that about myself. I, so I thought it was self-defeatist for a woman to, you know, it's hard enough for women. Why would you position yourself as an outsider? And now I just have a very different view. It's like it, our self-preservation requires that we declare, which is why the book is a declaration, why it's called She Proclaims, because we've internalized so much that we say out loud, like, yes, I I have been a woman struggling to work in a world that is not built for me. If you are a woman in the workplace today, you are working in a world that was built for someone else. If you're a person of color, you're working in a world that was built for someone else. We should appreciate that. And going in, and I now find, like, I'm proud to do that. And I, what I realized was, I thought I was doing good in a man's world. I was doing good propping it up and making it run well and perpetuating the power systems that keep all women, all people of color out of power. That was the realization I had going through the Clinton campaign and the aftermath. That's what I saw my role had been by keeping your head down, working hard, playing by the rules, thinking that if you just keep doing what you're doing, following a man's path, you're gonna get everything that men have. And I realized, that's no longer, for a while, I think that did work. We made progress. That's no longer challenging power systems. That's keeping them in place. It's buttressing them. When I went to work for Hillary, I did not think it was a big deal or that hard to elect the first woman president. I just thought she was the best person for the job. We had elected the first black president. I thought the first woman president would be easier. And then we ran into buzz saws everywhere. Why does she want this job? She's always so sketchy. She's always hiding something. She's always so suspicious. At the root of that, I think, is our unease, even in 2016, even in 2020, with having watching a woman seek the highest office in the land, which no one ever has, you know. And I didn't appreciate how important models are, that the fact that every time we heard a president speak, it was a man's voice for our entire history. Um, 
you know, all the leadership positions, 75% of Congress, even more at the time, are, are men. It's still a radical thing for a woman to seek power. And that was a really hard thing to wrestle with in real time because when she would get attacked, right, it was about Hillary. She's doing something wrong. She's doing something wrong. She's doing something wrong. And I saw pretty early on, this is something much bigger than just her. It's not even about her. It was bound to happen to the first woman. And then when Trump won, you know, it was not so much, not just that Hillary lost, but wow, how could he win? And I was so worried that women would feel um, disempowered and chastened and hide. And that's not at all what happened. We all felt empowered. We turned out by millions to march because something about that, you know, triggered at our gut level. We know we deserve better. And I guess we're going to have to fight for it now. I find it a relief for it all to be out in the open. You know, I find it a relief as try, I mean, the, um, that, that, that we had the protests that we had this summer about, um, uh, uh, over, over, over Black Lives Matter. And I find it a relief that we had me too, that we have this all out in the open. We understand what we're dealing with and we can do something about it now. And 90 days out, I just hope that people see as tragic as, you know, maybe the Trump presidency has been, it's caused actual deaths and untold, you know, turmoil, um, it's laid bare for us what the challenge is. And that's what prompted me to write this is like, here's what women can do. Here's the things you can leave behind that you can, you know, do in the world differently just by believing in yourself and other women um, more than you ever have before. I mean, it's are your sisters. God, I believe it so much. And it's, it's about truth telling. That's what I'm hearing. That's what I got out of uh, what. Yeah, you're... you know, that's why I wrote that. I wrote. Yeah, it's like I wrote that piece. That's why I wrote this piece for Vanity Fair about how white women can be better ally, Black Lives Matter allies. There's an ugly history there that's like painful to talk about it, but that's how you move on. Like you explain what we're inheriting, why people, why why people of colors are skeptical that white women are going to be good allies, and what you can do now beyond just protesting and voting, but being supportive of women in your own life and women of color in your own life if you're a white woman. Um, you know, I, I find it's very freeing to say all that. And it's in more and more difficult to talk about gender without talking about race, because race is the determinant of how people vote more than gender. Uh, because the majority of white women are conservative or Republicans and have been for a long time. Yep. Because women of color, and I know because that's... A, those are the uh, groups that I work with across the country, uh, consider themselves politically distinct from white women um, yeah. uh, and, and much more justice oriented. So I, I'm, I wanna go kind of back in history in your book, you do go back to the, um, the women who started uh, on the path and now that we're at a hundred years of suffrage, I think it's, uh, it's worth going back and looking at kind of the, the basis of what was considered the women's movement and those who uh, push, push the issue of suffrage forward um, and then what happened um, since. Caddy Sen is, is one person who's, for a lot of us, uh, black women, hey, that person's racist, didn't believe in the, uh, didn't believe in the, uh, the dignity and the civil rights of black women and men. Um, and she's venerated in some circles. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, Considered a hundred years when it's not for uh, black women and women of color. Uh, it, it isn't our hundred year of having access. How do we go back in the spirit, um, as you mentioned, of the protests that have been, uh, you know, in every state in the, the country sparked by the murder of George Floyd and address some of that, uh, the, the, the historic damage that's been done, but also the current way that it, uh, racism is manifest even in the women's movement. How do, how do we do that? Yeah, so that's why, I mean, that's what I tried to do here, right? Because I, I wanted to go back, I said, okay, 100 years, this is 100 anniversary of suffrage is this year. Um, that's the last time women kind of, you know, had a moment where they came together where, where there was a major structural, big structural change, Amy, was then. And what can you learn from it? And what I learned from it was women, when women do band together, they have remarkable power. And it is inspiring to me that even um, there's just one woman in particular, Quaker abolitionist woman named Miriam McClintock, who happens to uh, resonate with me. And she sat down with Elizabeth Cady Stanton to write the Declaration of Sentiments, you know, 150 years ago at their kitchen table. These women had no reason to believe that anybody's going to care what they said, right? But they thought it was important that they write it down and they declare that they're rights. And that's why I made mine a Declaration of Independence. And then you learn all the ugly things that happen along the way. Women's rights movement, a lot of it 
what started in the, ab the abolitionist movement, right? Women started engaging in that. They were excited to have some kind of political power. They wanted political power for themselves. There was a sense with the abolitionists, if women voted, they would vote to end slavery. And that was a good thing. So these movements are very much entwined. And then when it came, when we got to the 15th Amendment, which, you know, ostensibly gave African-American men in the country the right to vote, but not really because of Jim Crow, um, there was a big, ugly break. And the it was moving forward on behalf of just black men and women were left out. And that's when you when you see a terrible quote from Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Susan B. Anthony, or there was amazing impromptu debate that happened between Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass, this Albany civil rights event. Um, and that could happen today about the relative, you know, worth about who's got it worse in America. And Susan B. Anthony, in an early sign of cultural appropriation gone awry, tried to compare white women to the enslaved. And Frederick Douglass, in words that he could say, have said yesterday, said, when a woman, because she is a woman, is dragged from her home and her head is, is bashed in on the sidewalk, because she is a woman, then the white woman will have as much um, then, then, then her right will be as great as mine to get this right and to get it now. But until then, my needs are more dire. I feel the same way today as a white woman. I want to bust out of the patriarchy. I want everyone to do that. But I also know that the constraints I feel are not the constraints, the fear that you has been your whole life, Amy, or the whole life of anybody, people of color. And I think for white women, we have a hard time um, expressing that because we don't know what to do about it and we feel uncomfortable and we want to smooth things over and make things okay because in the absence of real power, that's what white women do. And we can't do that here. And I want, this is why I've written about this um, in different forums to say, understand this history, the white woman that falsely accused Emmett Till of harassing her, the white woman who falsely accused of a man in Tulsa of raping her, they led to murders. The 53% of us who voted for Donald Trump, like this is why people of color can be skeptical of us. Um, but you don't, you have to know that history, that's your legacy, but don't expect to be able to fix it with a Instagram post or a tweet. You gotta be, you gotta vote, you gotta protest, you gotta be a good citizen to women to all people of color in your own life. You got to advocate for them in your workplace. Um, that's how we get, you got to see that we are all aligned. The same power systems that keep us from getting real power are the power systems that really hold um, people of color back. And it's all the same fight. It's interesting in your, um, you also have a, a two questions. One is there is a section in your book that says, Here's the advice, and I couldn't help but thinking, you know, this is directed to women, but in particular white women around how to show up differently, how to evolve, how to transform, yeah. be part of the solution. Yeah. Um, where, where for you are the models of white women who are upholding that part, who are being anti-racist, who are racial justice? I mean, this is this is the role that you you are in, but and and where do you look for inspiration and people who will show millions of people how it's done? I mean, I've seen it. Well, I think it's, I think it's, I mean, I want women have to get, white women have to get over this fear because I think they have a real fear of not knowing the right thing to say or do. And also uh, we hate owning, we have such a, I think because we feel like we don't really belong in the man's world, um, that we're very, uh, we own things that are not our own problems and we don't know how to solve them, we freak out. <laughs> So that's what I think is happening there. It is in terms of women that I've looked to for inspiration for how to do this. You know, this is a good thing about having grown up in democratic politics is I'm around like I've worked with a really diverse group of people all along and had a lot of great, um, uh, particularly black women friends that show me I, you know, they don't say this, but I know they know that I have racial biases in my head and they love me anyway. <laughs> and they're just glad to have the ally to show up who wants to learn and to be supportive. I, Hillary Clinton, you know, is somebody who I've seen do that. Um, she didn't have that reputation in 16 at one level, but with, with the people who actually had worked with her for decades, they understood that, you know, she had put real time and real, uh, and real fight in that. But what I've learned is like, even if you don't have all the answers, show up, try to do it. You can't understand to use like your point of privilege to help. And, you know, like that's when change starts to happen. Everybody can do something. What's so interesting is now um, we are in the last week of July and Vice President Joe Biden has announced 
or plans to announce, he said, uh, that uh, he will you know, reveal who's going to be on the ticket with him, who his vice presidential uh, uh, pick will be. He publicly uh, has already acknowledged months and months ago that it will be a woman. Um, and groups like myself have been advocating for a woman of color, a black woman, um, uh, for, for, you know, maybe the, the first part of uh, 2020. I think whoever is the vice presidential pick, I would love to get your thoughts and your lessons learned from 2016 about how to give this vice presidential candidate room. Yeah, how, totally. How, to, um, how oh, do, God. how do we, how, how, because um, what I'm hearing you say is the things that happened in 2016, they're still alive and well. We saw that with AOC. Yep. So what can we do? So with AOC, we saw it with how the presidential candidates, you know, the, I, I think there was progress, right, from presidential, uh, from 16 to 20. Um, uh, the first Elizabeth Warren got in the race, Politico did a story that said, uh, how is she going to deal with the likability problem? And I was like, ugh. But everybody went crazy on Politico. <laughs> and, you know, so it was and everybody, the women had to deal with the electability question, which, of course, like sets you up to fail because if you're fighting to prove that you can win, that's like a tougher. So the women still had it tougher. But I think it was in, we were more aware of these. Um, we are more aware of the hard uh, road the women candidates have to hoe. Um, Amy, I believe you and I were on Andrea Mitchell together the day of your forum. In Houston, right? You did that for him in Houston, I think. The shoot the people. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing is, Andrea showed us a poll, and you, me, and Andrea were all like heads exploding because it showed Biden, Buttigieg, and Bernie as a top three vote getters in that poll um, in March or March or April, right? Or no, it was May. Was it May? Whenever you're April 2019. Yes, yes. Okay, and I yeah. remember. Yeah. And my head is exploding. And Andrea was like, I don't understand. I thought this was resolved last time. Hillary, she met all the standards. She was a commander in chief. She proved that women could do this. Why are the women not doing well in the Democratic primary? And that is because we all, all of us, Democrats, Republicans, progressives, conservatives, the far left, the far right, everybody has biases in our heads about what a leader looks like. And we gravitated to Pete Buttigieg, Beto O'Rourke, the young, white man, ambitious, earnest, we recognize him right away. We recognize him right away. We have seen his story play out time and time and time again. He is at his finch. He is Mr. Smith goes to Washington. We know that. And the women have to prove themselves. And the women draw fire because they have the audacity to have ambition. And again, I really want people to know, like, I do not think everybody is sexist who has this view. This is like so deeply embedded in us. And this poor woman who is going to become the running mate is in for it because I hope and think it'll be a woman of color. It may be your senator or your congresswoman. I mean, uh, listen, all all of the above are all of the above. okay with us. It's yeah. great. <laughs> right. Um, and so she is going to and and um, she'll get criticized. She'll get a lot of attack from Trump because Trump wants to make that woman the face of the radical left, Antifa, defund the police, all the rest of it. Um, the stuff that he can't get to stick to Biden. There'll be all this pontificating about how Biden made a mistake by picking this woman because now they're making these attacks. They, they're they going to make those attacks no matter what. And this woman's going to get criticized because there's all these attacks coming at her and they are, have nothing to do with her. This is just about being the first, you know, you know, the woman that we hope is, I hope anyway, is going to actually become the first vice president. Um, and we have to have her back if you want, you know, Joe Biden to win. If you, 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 you got to have her back and he can't be part of the chorus that's saying like, oh, there's just something about her. She's so shrill. She's so ambitious. These are all things that are going to be said about her. They don't have anything to do with her. They are all the uncomfortableness we're still getting through about a woman seeking that kind of power. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go to some of the questions we're getting from the audience, and just to remind you all who are joining us live, put your uh, comments in the chat, either YouTube um, or uh, in the comments if you're watching on Facebook, so that I can get uh, get to your questions. Um, but I want I want to go a little bit level deeper because you're an expert in communications. You've yeah. already run in 2016, uh, Trump. <laughs> with, right with all his history of sexual abuse and, and disgusting behavior and be, and language now still was able to 
you know, get in there and either, uh, you know, activate the people who, who accept this kind of behavior and who are part of that culture. What specifically do you think needs to happen around uh, a woman, a woman of color VP? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, and immediately we're talking about next week. Right. So I think that for her, I think that it's going to be really important. This is a very tactical thing. I think it's going to be really important that she has an aggressive schedule that's based on issues where she is surrounded virtually, of course, by people that are, rep, you know, that are representative of the kind of change that Biden and she are trying to enact. Specific policy stuff. People always like, oh, Democrats want to fall back on policy and nobody cares. It is a way to drive coverage. And if she is not driving coverage and driving an agenda and a message and showing being surrounded by people that support it, she is going to be a sitting duck and she's going to get a ton of attacks, right? And you can't do that to her. So even more so than Biden, who I don't think has as much um, of a need to be pushing some kind of news every day. You got to keep the press occupied. You got to like put something around her that's not just her because there'll be so much interest in her. You know, the the other three guys aren't that interesting to us anymore. Pence, Trump, and Biden, we know a lot about them. There's going to be a ton of attention focused on her. Stay on substance. And those of us, like when they're, when the attacks do happen, we need to like put them in the right lane about what they're really about and show and not be scared to say that. Um, Cause that's going to have her, um, that's going to have her um, back as well. And then the other thing, this will not be pleasant for um, whoever it is, but Trump, you know, as we've seen, Trump can go down rabbit holes attacking women. And some of these women, you know, Kamala Harris in particular is really good on the debate stage. She's really good interrogating someone. She's really good at baiting somebody and she's really good at taking a punch and landing a punch. Um, he will go down a rabbit hole. It will not be pleasant, but it will not be good for him. There are times when Trump is ugly and awful and he's, and that makes him effective. And there's times where he's just spinning his wheels and wasting his time. And the way he'll go after this woman, I predict will be him spinning his wheels and wasting his time. And you know, that, you know, so keep that in mind as you're, as you're watching it, but do remember she is not doing something wrong. This is a historic reckoning and, you know, thing that we have to push through. Yeah, and 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 a lot of your 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 comments seem to be motivated by like, look, we got to open our eyes. We're not naive. This is what it is this to is what it is bust out of the box <laughs> and have power, uh, which I'm all uh, all for. And we got to be Move ready. Move forward, draw and fire. And there is nothing that draws fire like a woman moving forward. That you know, so like you're, and this is true for every woman in our own lives too, right? You just because you get criticized, does not mean you're doing it wrong. And it's uncomfortable to get criticized. And some of us don't have the luxury of doing that in the workplace because, you know, it's our livelihood and I respect that. But if you do have that, if you do have the move, you do have the room to do that. You have to do that. That is the charge of like, you know, as a white woman in my, I'm 53 years old. I feel like that's the charge of my generation for too long. I rested on the legacy and the fight that women who came before me did and didn't realize I'm propping up the white male patriarchy. I'm making it worse for people of color because when I acquiesce to it, because I think if I just play by the rules, I can get my little piece of it. I'm like holding everyone back. And this is like, so now maybe it's going to be a little uncomfortable, but it's absolutely thrilling at the same time and empowering. And like, look at AOC, look at Ayanna Presley, look at these incredibly uh, brave women who are killing it and you know, become impervious. You tell the truth enough, you find it rhymes with everything. Mm. That is a, yeah, that's a Jason Isbell uh, lyric for those of the, for the Jason Isbell fans. I'm sure they are because it's the Bay Area. Uh, but yeah, you tell the truth enough, you find it rhymes with everything. I love that. Sounds Good. like you've gone, it sounds like this has been a transformational period of totally. time for you. Totally, totally, yeah. Yeah, it's it really has, yeah. Yeah, it's all, you know, it's just very, it's very clear to me um, in a way that it, you know, wasn't just a, uh, a few years ago. There's glimpses and like any epiphany, right? You've probably had been carrying that along with you the whole time. But, you know, like all women going back through all history, I think we all had something burning in us that's like, this isn't quite right. And right. It's not, it's not, it's not quite right. But there's something you can do about it. You know, I, the, the number one thing we could do about it is support other women, you know, support all women, support all people of color, do it in your own life. Believing that we are in competition with other marginalized populations for a finite amount of success is what keeps this all, which yeah. keeps the lid on it all. It, that is absolutely what keeps the lid on it. And also, you know, it, what's, what's really amazing in this period is 
for women of color to be actually visible because there's a way that politics has been is described who lives in this country, who's a special interest, and often it was women, yeah, or people of color, or totally, women, yeah, yeah. or black people. Then we're not visible in in that calculus, and um, even now polling and and other kinds of analysis. We have to push our way to be seen, heard, listened to. So I, I do think there is an opportunity on the kind of personal level and a cultural level for this kind of transformation. Do you agree? I totally agree. And this is what I, you know, the it's painful. I mean, to see the agony that Black Americans were, you know, just spilling out in the streets during uh, the, you know, after the killing of George Floyd is just like wrenching, but just also a release. And then I think, you know, for white Americans, this is why so many white Americans are being freaked out because we know that in, by our reacting so strongly, what we are revealing is we didn't understand it was this bad and that's humiliating and troubling. And we're embarrassed by that, but now we all see it as this bad. And for whatever reason, that being the tipping point um, there's just a lot more empathy and I feel really positive about what the power of that, that can do where the country can go with it. Yeah. And how sustained the demand has been. It's not just toppling. It's not, it's not going back. It's yeah. monuments and retelling history is actually dealing with public policy right now. And I think that's where uh, the rubber hits the road in terms of sus sustained change. I want to go to a couple of questions that we've gotten from the audience. Lynn, thank you so much for the question. Uh, I think many women are disheartened to have to vote for two older white men who have been accused of sexual assault. What do you think about this? And do you agree with the quote, vote blue no matter who, unquote? Uh, I sure do right now. I mean, I don't, but like, I don't think, like, I love Joe, I know Joe Biden. I love Joe Biden. I'm like excited to uh, cast a vote uh, for him and, uh, you know, do whatever I could to help him. Um, I have thought as you might, as, as, as Lynn, right. It was Lynn who asked the question as Lynn might imagine, you might not imagine Amy imagine you felt a lot about this. I have thought a lot about how the Democrats ended up at the end, you know, as we did in the beginning, in the beginning of the primary, when you were on, we're on with Andrea Mitchell and all of our heads were exploding about why the Democrats are defaulting to two older white men and a young white man. And I think we ended up with uh, Sanders and Biden at the end of the Democratic primary because this is, I mean, Biden, uh, they truly had the most experience. And that did in this environment where people were really worried about beating Trump, you know, Sanders has his own energy. But for Biden, uh, people worried about beating Trump. They thought he was the best choice to do that and perhaps the best president because of the experience. But he only had the most experience than anybody else because the rest of the stage in the form of Julian Castro, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, Kirsten Gillibrand, um, Tulsi Gabbard, um, I'm forgetting, I'm sure I'm forgetting, Amy Klobuchar, um, uh, decades ago didn't have the opportunities that Joe Biden had, right? So when Kamala Harris was 29 years old, being elected state as senator, United States senator was not a thing for a black woman, right? Yes. But when Joe Biden was 29 years old, it was. And I think that, so I'm a hopeful person. I believe that this was the last cycle where the men, because that, because with people, all women, all people of color were denied opportunities decades ago. Um, that they their 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 experience trumped them, um, and I think that in this like wanting to you know some weird wanting to return to normal um, propelled that both mm. of those people held them. It's so interesting the role that um, women of color who are the most likely women in the Democratic Party um, to vote for women candidates. <laughs> um, but so interesting the role of women of color in choosing or winnowing down the field. Um, uh, Joe Biden's presidential primary campaign was kind of DOA uh, until uh, it went to the southern states. It was it was older black women Democrats who who yes. were in force behind him. So I thought that it's a it's a complicated story. It's a, and I do think you know the um, I mean in the end I I did not think Joe Biden was going to be the nominee. I just thought there was no way you can't come in fourth and fifth in Iowa and New Hampshire. Democrats never elect the past. They're always looking for the future. They're always going to somebody, somebody new. I thought for sure after Nevada that Bernie was going to be the nominee. Mm -hmm. And the, it, the Biden campaign, it's not like Biden was like not great in New Hampshire and then amazing in South Carolina. He was still Joe Biden, right? Which is like 
great, but not the best candidate. Um, and people just turned out for him in huge numbers. And, you know, Amy, I don't know, I've heard lots of explanations from this from uh, black voters I talked to, which is that like, I got a lot on the line, you know, as a black American, and I got to get rid of this guy. And I know America. And so I'm voting for him because I know that's that he's the best chance that we have to win. And I would love for Kamala to be the nominee or I'd love for Cory Booker, but we'll get there. But right now we just got to get this guy out. I mean, there's some measure of that. There's some measure of people, um, African-Americans that have like real deep love for Joe Biden going back decades that, you know, when I was out, I was covering this stuff for the circus, um, uh, which is a, a television show. It's not just politics. Um, and, you know, I found a lot of that as, um, as well. And, um, uh, and the South Carolinas and the Super Tuesday states, black women were, yeah, the first to like be like, I'm gonna back, I'm gonna back him. Uh, black women were the best supporters for Hillary. You know, they like understood. Um, they seemed to have empathy for her. Um, you know, for some of the difficulties she'd been through in her life in a way that other people um, uh, didn't show or didn't want to show. Um, and it wasn't an, it wasn't a common uh, knowledge. I mean. A lot, of, a lot of us understood that black women were the highest vote turnout yep. uh, uh, voters of any race and gender and the most anyway. real Democrats. But yep. it wasn't common knowledge and nor was the campaign run as if that was the case. So in places where black women's high turnout would have made a difference, like, uh, I mean, a lot of states, but in, but the Midwest states in particular, uh, the, I, 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 I suspect given the way that the Biden campaign is running, understanding the key role of women of color and black women is going to be maybe one of the things that's different. They do. Well, I think that in the Clinton campaign, it was, I mean, I've all, you know, I've been, I was raised in black politics. I knew black women were the best voters, bar none, period, no matter which party. And they were the most likely to vote for Democrats in that. Like, I knew that. Um, the, you know, like people talk about like the Midwestern states, right? We lost Pennsylvania, we lost Michigan, we lost Wisconsin. We could have won Michigan, we could have won Wisconsin. It wouldn't matter without Pennsylvania. You know, it like, it wasn't, it wasn't there. And there were times where you see things happening and are powerless to do something to stop them because there was some bizarre larger force about pushing for a weird kind of change in America that I did not understand. And it was, it's a funny thing, Amy, by the time we got to the campaign, it's like you could see this happening, but it felt too late to get people to listen to you. Um, that was true for some voters on the Democratic side, and it was really true for a lot of independents and voters on the Republican side. Um, so I think that, like, the Biden campaign is just in a totally different universe. Um, and, you know, I'm just super hopeful for a different outcome. <laughs> you and millions and millions and millions of, of, of Americans. Yeah. Jeffrey, I'm coming to your question. Uh, Jeffrey asks, for the Democrats among us, what are the biggest blind spots heading into the election? I like that question. Thanks, Jeffrey. That's a good question. Um, well, I think that, you know, we're not, nobody's complacent. I think that's the biggest like BS narrative is that Democrats are overconfident there. I don't know one Democrat who is um, overconfident. Uh, I would say that here's what I worry about with Trump. Um, here's where he could come back. Right. Uh, so much of the bad numbers for him right now are tied to COVID. Um, in February, you know, people thought there's a lot of people that didn't like, uh, Donald Trump, but they thought he was a strong leader. They thought he cared about people like them. Um, and now that's flipped. That people don't think he's a strong leader. He's underwater, as we say in the business, um, on that number. And um, he is as well. And being like cares about people like you as opposed to cares about rich people and, and, and the powerful, that's a really tough thing for him. And then COVID's just destroyed him. If he does small things with COVID and looks like he's got his on a path to figuring this out and on a path to having economic recovery work in tandem with COVID recovery that he could come back because it's all about how bad COVID is. The other thing that, um, the other thing is, is abortion is a huge issue for uh, Trump supporters. And a lot of people who are saying they will not vote for Joe Biden. I mean, excuse me, Donald Trump right now will come home to him in the end because of that issue. We saw it happen with the third debate with Hillary where uh, Trump talked a lot about the courts, um, talked a lot about abortion. You could feel it, the people coming back to him. That's one of the things that led to her 
loss. And, you know, I think as Democrats, we're like, well, how can these, you know, how can um, religious uh, Christian voters uh, vote for him? He's so terrible. And, um, you know, having the center, um, uh, having the center do things that you don't like, but also be important to you because he uh, will do the right thing on abortion in their mind is not at odds with the Christian faith. <laughs> like, that is part of the Christian faith. Christian faith is people are sinners and they don't expect Trump to be perfect and they're willing to put up with a lot. And I think that is a big blind spot that people have um, uh, about, uh, about, you know, and that's, those are the two things that could happen that would flip this in his way. Interesting. Interesting. I would also, uh, I, I wonder a lot about the blind spots with the democratic party and where the money's flowing right now. Um, I was surprised to see, um, and, you know, back harkening back to your book, it's the man's world that, uh, you got John Kasich with a, with a, with a place on the DNC stage for the convention. This is a, this is a, uh, a, a guy who was behind eliminating souls to the polls. He's the early voting that benefited, uh, especially black churchgoers yeah. going to vote early. And, uh, it was a voter suppression move. Now he, he's speaking on the stage. So just talk to me about that. Is that a blind spot trying to go for these never Trump? I mean, in, you know, everybody thinks I have some, I have some, mis, I have some skepticism about the never Trumpers. Right. And also like, where are they going to be when Biden's president? And like, what are they going to be spending the Democrats that are giving money to these people? What are they going to be spending that? They're going to be spending that money to defeat Joe Biden's agenda. That's what they're going to be doing. Well, this so, is a Lincoln project and some of the other high profile efforts. Yeah, like that's like, you know, that's, you know, like just know that their ads are great and they get under Trump's skin and that can be useful. But I don't know if it's, I mean, Amy, like I worry about it. Cause you're like, is that a blind spot? Or are they just trying to play multidimensional chess, right? And I, I don't think, you know, I know the people there really well. And I know that they know you have John Kasich on the stage. And that's not a slam dunk. They know that that's going to come with, um, you know, like that there's going to be people that are upset about it. Having that come out first, you're like, hmm, is that, you know, was that a mistake? Sometimes that, you know, sometimes things just leak. So I wonder about that. Um but I do think that the people who are really, you know, Jenna Malley Dillon, the people that are really running the campaign, like they get, they know, who, they know who elects Democrats. It's not Republicans, <laughs> you know, it's not. <laughs> okay. All right. We can just, we let's just throw that out. Who's most likely to vote for a Democrat, a woman of color, who's really a black woman. A <laughs> black a, woman <laughs> is the black, you get every black, eligible like, black woman who win these, close these margins. Okay. Yeah. Let, let me go to Tara's question. Uh, Tara, this is a good one. The media often seems to reduce female leaders to stereotypes. Female leaders are more caring. For example, how do we support female leaders and avoid repeating these patriarchal stereotypes? These are the things that's great. Good. Tara. These are the things that are, these are the things that are gender. And I don't like, I'm not going to tolerate any notion that they're not about gender. She's shrill. She's sketchy. She's suspicious. She has too much ambition. All of these things are, you know, she, or she's too tough. All of these things are about gender and they don't mean that you're sexist if you have them in your head it means that you're still like adjusting your eyesight to what it looks like to have a woman in these um in these roles and i really feel the need to call them out you know when i hear them when i you know when i hear friends or sometimes people in my own family like i don't know there's just something about her i don't like that's when we're getting at gender it's like when it's about motivation and also just this something sort of amorphous that you don't quite, can't quite put your finger on. Um, and the press are, part of the problem with the press and part of the problem with some Democrats and, you know, progressive, progressive men, uh, particularly progressive white men, is they're so sure they're not racist. They're so sure they're not sexist. They're more blind than anyone to their biases. I agree right? with that. It That's is. True. It's so true. <laughs> Like in some ways they're the worst because they're so certain they're not racist or sexist. How could they possibly? And it's like, I'm here to tell you, I have to check myself 10 times a day on racial and gender bias. We all have it in us. 
and you really got to look for it and then call it out when it happens. And I do find if you call it, if you do call it out, you know, most people don't want to be that way. They're like, Oh, I have you know, people are pretty good. Like I don't hadn't thought of it that way. I didn't, you know, see it. And even if, the, even if it makes them mad, it sticks with them. It's in their head. It is now in their head. <laughs> it's like, you, and they'll think about it again. Yeah. I think um, we talk about the media and having a new frame with which to cover someone at the top of the ticket. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we saw the challenges that um, Senator Kamala Harris faced. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, during the primary, um, the yeah. unique attacks that she, uh, she that were leveled uh, through the media, uh, I, I guess what really what, she was really held to a different standard, and there was like all these questions. Like I would hear reporters say all the time, like, "Well, you know, she's so cautious." And I, I was, you know, normally I understand when I hear reporters have a, they have a critique, even if I don't agree with it. I know like where it's coming from. There's some kernel of truth, and I was like. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about. And I press them more and more like, well, what, and like what they're really saying when they're saying she's being cautious is they believe for no reason other than they believe it. They believe she's hiding what she really thinks. And so they're saying she's being cautious because she's not being as lefty as they believe she is. And I'm like, why do you believe she's lefty? Is it because she's a black woman from Oakland? <laughs> like, what she's is going on? And she's also South Indian. Or right, that like Californian that speaks uh, to lots of different races of people that she, what do you, she's yeah. only the second black woman in our history to be in the Senate. Yeah. Uh, and um, there's a lot of terrible reasons why. And, and at the hands of Democrats, there's not a lot of women uh, yeah. Black women who make it that far. I'd yeah. say then women of color who, who even get in the Senate. So it's interesting the stories around her in particular. Um, but also, yeah. you know, we're, we, what what advice do you give uh, uh, reporters or editors? Oh, or, I do. Or, I mean, this is like a good thing. Yeah, this is a good thing. I've a good role I've had in 20 because I don't have a candidate is to point this out to people and really push them. And again, like these reporters don't, Nobody likes to hear like what your your view is sexist and there's, you know, so you have, it's hard to penetrate that. But I do find when I'm like not arguing, but trying to lead them down this path of like, I really think there's not anything under your suspicion of Kamala Harris being too cautious. Um, and it does help. And it does help with and editors in particular who are not on the front lines or maybe a little more open to this. But it is something I talk to people about a lot. And then I talk to a lot of women reporters who just call me to vent, you know, about, you know, what their editor said or what they, you know, and be a sounding board um, for that. But I sure talk about it a lot. I think about it all the time, as you can see. Well, I get uh, I will admit to also having um, relationship with some reporters who call me around the women of color thing. I just remember a couple of weeks ago, a reporter called me and said, will you read this article? Because my editor thinks I should base my reporting based on this thing. And it's really controversial. I don't see it. And I often find that we're in this, um, this culture shift where um, we're, we're all going to think different things. Or do you agree with that? We're going to, this period through this um, uh, election cycle, this period of upheaval, that we're going to believe different things out of the, you know, after we go through it, but that as reporters trying to make sense in the moment, uh, they got to, they got to talk to someone. Okay. Can you give me a gut check? Is this right? Or I is had that. Yeah. Yeah. I get that too. I get that too. Cause they're like, they're just trying to record history as we're like living it and making it. And I do get, I get men and women both actually that do the, the exact same thing, Amy, to be like, I, my editor said this. And isn't that like not the right way to be looking at this? <laughs> it's like, or is it you know, like, you were correct. Saying that <laughs> Stacey Abrams, um, not willing to concede her election, even though she was not going to be governor, is going to haunt her because we want women to concede. You're right that that's a kind of sexist and like, you know, racially mo- loaded way to look at this, and you shouldn't look at it that way. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Now people are like, you know what, uh, Andrew Gillum, um, who's uh, you know came within what a point and a half of being governor of Florida. Boy, he should have hung on a little bit longer, you know. And so now there's a different. Understanding I that. know now there's a different right there's a different thing yeah, but when yeah, terrible yeah, yeah. All, all the coronavirus issues okay Nick I'm That's coming to you there was this moment um during the primary 
where Senator Kamala Harris was in the same screen as um, Nikki Haley. Um, Nikki, ha it's interesting because Nikki Haley is, is she, and Nick asked this in, in our audience today, is she likely to be the first woman presidential candidate nominated by the GOP? It's not probably going to happen 2020, of course, but right. if we look at the GOP, it's an overwhelmingly white party, uh, but are we going to see some rising stars or women, women of color on the other side? I don't think so. I mean, I know everybody thinks, like, I'm totally at odds with everybody else. Like, everybody's like, Nikki Haley is going to be the next... Uh, uh, the next uh, nominee for the Republican Party. And it's like, what about how the Republican Party has behaved in the last four years makes you think that they're going to pick a, 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 a dark-skinned immigrant, you know, woman who was like raised by an immigrant family to be their nominee? Like, I understand intellectually, like, oh, it'd be really smart of them. It'd be a real jiu-jitsu. Like, yeah, I get it. They're not going to do it. I think they're going to elect another white men, it might be Ben Sass. But the idea that, I, I mean, I'd like to think that that's what they were going to do. I'd like to think that they were that open, but I, I just don't see it. Well, <laughs> uh, no, thank, like, no, th thank you for that question. Cause I, I, you know, we, we, we shouldn't look at this and you're not really, cause when you, when, when you're talking about, she proclaims and a declaration of independence, you're actually not talking about party. You're talking about something bigger. No, I'm not talking about party at all. I mean, I'm talking about um, what I, and this is like why it is a declaration is because we have to say these things out loud that we've internalized that tell us we're not as valuable as men and that we have to shed the, um, the, the, like the doubts that we have that say we're not as interesting or um, don't just des as deserving as much power as men. I mean, it's just crazy that a hundred years after women won the right to vote, which sort of like helped pride open, at least for white women at the time, uh, in, you know, get us into professions, get us into, into the political space, consistently undervalued, grossly underrepresented in positions of power. We are not doing it wrong. There's nothing more for women to prove you have come as far as you can come in a world that was not made for you. We followed a man's path and it led us some places for a while and now it has turned into a rut. And at the root of that is a sense that we are in competition with other women, that we are in competition with marginalized people. And if you understand that when women, you know, more women in power begets more women in power, 30% to being theory, 30% of an institution um, becomes women, becomes people of color. That is when the lid comes off and you have real change. That's when people don't feel as if they are some kind of other, but they are, um, you are they're judged on their own skills as a, as a person. And the big mistake women make is like what Alice Walker said is like the big mistake about not using power is thinking you don't have any. And we make the world run. We really, really do. But we don't run the world because we don't have that last piece of the power. And this in thinking that you that only some of us can succeed is what keeps a lid on it. And, you know, you have to believe in your the power of your own voice. You have to t value the resource, the resources and skills you've developed in the man's world. You have to support other women. You have to support people of color. Like these things, when you band them together, are going to make real change. But like we all have that burning in us that knows this is not right. We're deserving of something better. And you were right. You're not wrong to have the imposter syndrome. You are working in a world that was not built for you. Um and that is, but I have so much faith in women and their abilities. It's just, it's this thing in our head that holds us that like is, you know, and I'm not naive to think like, it's just change your mind and then you can change everything about the world. But when you change the way you engage in the world, you are changing it. And it doesn't mean you're not going to meet fire because women moving forward do draw fire, but it is the way we're not going to, we can't continue to do the same thing and just prop up these systems that aren't working for us. Women had the highest rate of unemployment in, 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 in COVID and were the most essential workers and in the lowest paid professions and bearing the burden of all the all the pressures at home more than the men, right? Like this can't stand. And this is what's this <laughs> is what's in your power to change. But how do you respond to people who criticize an approach that says, you know, it's a re really around women's empowerment or you could see versions of this, a girl mm -hmm. power kind of thing. 
and says, look, the solution's not an essential is just deep belief in women, because we've seen women who don't who uphold the patriarchy are racist, sure. are doing, you know, what how do you respond to that? Um uh, in, in in a way that, you know, kind of responds to those criticisms and also helps us to see uh, the ways that we can come together. Because those women aren't doing, those women are not, um, those women are not, this is like, this is, this is what I think white women have to understand is that when you, the, um, it's like the workplace is a relatively safe place for us. It's safer. It's safer for somebody who looks like me than it is for somebody who likes, who looks like you. I have more opportunity, not great opportunity, but I have more opportunity at it. And when we settle for scraps, right? I'm not saying that women have all the answers, but I'm saying that when women settle for scraps, when white women settle for scraps in particular, and don't push to get what women, what, what, you know, our work is worth, we are keep we are holding everyone back because that just props this up that just perpetuates like why do we keep getting generation after generation of white men continuing to run to rise to power even though every you know it's sort of accept in this country that we want everyone to do well and i believe that people do men and women both want women to do well people want you know we 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 want all people of color to do better in this country and have more opportunity but but it doesn't happen and there's not like a magic law to change it's like you have to behave differently and so i do believe that if all women no matter what political persuasion they were if they just said i'm going to band together and support other women and make sure that they have you know that they're treated well in the workplace and i'm going to echo them and i'm going to support them and i'm going to advocate to hire a more diverse workforce in my workplace like yeah that would change no matter what party that person is that is what's going to um that's what's going to you know more of the same is is, is not going to is is just it's not, we're just not getting anywhere, but there's like, I just really, I've lived it. I mean, you know, you've talked about like transformation I've had, I have lived it in my own life. I have seen it happen. Women have my back more than they have in my entire life, you know, and I just, that last in the last uh, few years, they are not my competition. They are my support system. And if I could give one piece of advice to my younger self, it is, you are not these, you are not in competition with these women they are going to be, they, you know, we are going, we literally rise together. It is what you want to be true. And it is. Well, talking about the younger self, um, and this might be one of our final questions as we're uh, rounding out our hour. Raquel asks, um, are either of you excited about how engaged Gen Z seems to be, especially leading up to the first election that they can vote in? Um. I'm sure I'm like super excited about it. I mean, I'm, a, you know what I'm excited about with Gen Z and millennial women, they are the most likely demographic to believe that men have it easier in America than women. Is that right? I lo- yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And I love that they see it at a young age. I think if I was asked that question when I was in my twenties, I would have said, no, of course not. It's everything's equal. Cause I wanted to believe that. And that's what I, you know, thought was, and I, you don't, you didn't want to be one of the women that was complaining back then. Right. I didn't, I didn't want to be one of the women complaining. That's what women who couldn't make it, who couldn't hack it would do. And now these young women are like, yeah, women have it harder. And we're, you know, since that means there's going to be change. Women are running for office in huge numbers, as you know, she the people. And even if they're not winning, the fact that they are willing to do it and believe in themselves enough to go do it, not because they made a calculation somehow they can win, like that's what gives me hope. That's what like I think makes real change is when you tell us like where the country's going, when people are willing to do to take that kind of action, that bodes real well. They're courageous. That generation yeah. of women i'm like the the country is right it's the first generation of women that are majority women of color and in many places there is no majority minority dynamic there's a multiracial dynamic and uh and when i think of gen z i remember this viral video that came out a few weeks ago during the kentucky primary uh, the the polls had been that they basically the black area of louisville had had uh, they'd collapsed all these polling locations right. in one polling location. Yep. The parking lot, just a side note, was half a mile away where people had to run and try to make it before the polls were closed and they were banging on the doors to be let in. It was a such a, just, you know, this situation where mostly black people, it was a multiracial group, but mostly black people were trying to, to, to vote. 
And in comes in the viral video, a mom, probably, you know, our age or a little, maybe a little younger and her 18 year old daughter, um, this woman with braids with her arms folded and said, this is my first election. And she was mad. And I thought, okay, Gen Z's ready. Yeah. 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 Right. Like they just expect better and they know they deserve it as humans throughout human history have done. It's yeah. a- it's, it's, good. A, it's, a, it's amazing. I agree with you. I think that next generation, we got to, we got to move at some point, we got to move aside, you know, it's like our gen oh, yeah. has to like make space for the leadership, but it's coming. Okay. In, um, it's an informed tradition to ask all of our speakers to answer the following question. So here's yours. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? We would love to hear yours, Jennifer. I mean, I, you know, I've thought about this and I, I, I I can't say other than like support all women, support all women, support you in like believe that includes yourself. Like it's just this, I so believe this is what's keeping the lid on. It's keeping the lid on people not being able to, to succeed and reach power. No one looks at the world today and thinks things are going well. Nobody thinks that it's not even working for white men. It's like, this is where it's all broken. And this is like in your power to do, to believe in yourself, to believe in all women, you know, all people of color that, that takes the, that, that is the game changer. It changes. It takes the lid off of it. We need to take the lid off. Yeah. Really, we, we, in this moment, we need to, to take advantage of, or transform things. I mean, yeah. you're talking about some fundamental shifts, aren't, aren't you? Fundamental shifts, but don't you think that's what's happening? I mean, this is like, I mean, I, I saw this in 16. I understood what was happening. I was like, whoa, this is a reckoning. Like these are frustrations that have been roiling under the surface from the beginning when this country was founded on genocide, Native Americans, slavery, disenfranchisement of women. And that bill came due like, and that, and then plus we had huge economic changes and big demographic changes and all of these things are just like stewing in America. And it just came roiling to the surface. And now either America is going to figure it out, which I believe we are, we're going to become that we're going to realize that ideal that it's not just white men who own land that are created equal. Right. Um, Or, or, or the scary part consideration, the scary thing to consider is like, is it too late for America? Whereas too many rights denied for too long, too much pain, too much power concentrated in too few hands. Is it too late or can we be, or is this reckoning happening just in time that we can revitalize democracy the way people like Ocasio-Cortez represent, the way people like Ayanna Presley represent? Like, I believe we can do it. And I'm with you. Big, big stuff. Yeah, you're with really yeah. big it, stuff. It, it, I'm it, in it. I'm in it with you. You're definitely in it, but like I, if you believe it can happen too, that's good. I want to I want to thank you for um first of all your beautiful book, thank also you. sharing your own journey and helping show uh uh women of color white women how we can work together to transform and lead the country forward and I I really really appreciate and uh, and honor you for your for your work and the leadership you're showing right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer, and me. Yeah, Jennifer yeah. I appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us on Unforum and the Commonwealth Club. You can find Jennifer's book She Proclaims at your local bookstore. Uh, probably order online. Uh, since yeah, you know stores. bookshop is a great <laughs> bookshop is the is a you know band of independent booksellers that come together to, you know, so you can order online through them, but shop.org. So awesome. You know, awesome. Yeah. If you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth club's effort in making virtual programming, visit the Commonwealth club.org slash online. I'm Amy Allison, founder of she, the people. Thank you and stay safe. <laughs>